Um, tonight, I'm very pleased to introduce this evening's speaker, Irma Boom. I first encountered Irma Boom's work when a friend presented me with a two-volume set of books created to document the Dutch Postal Service's stamp designs for 1987-1988, so I'm immediately dating myself. Um, I was very young at the time. Um, <laughs> Although I did not know of Irma's work at the time, it was immediately apparent that the person who had designed these books had created something special with a keen awareness and sensitivity to the materials in printing. These books, or these volumes actually, would be the first of many designs to enter and capture the attention of the book design world. A sphere of design which at times, especially then, was firmly entrenched in the traditions and conventions of fine book printing which I have nothing against, but <laughs> it's always good to push. Um, it is fair to say that Irma's designs utterly transforms one's expectations of books and their design, constantly pushing the boundaries not only of typography, text image conventions, but also materiality and binding. Additionally, through major projects, she has blurred the roles of author, editor, and designer. Several years later, I finally had the opportunity to meet Irma when we both taught courses at the Jan van Eyck Academy in the 1990s. Since founding her own studio in Amsterdam in 1991, Boom's work has garnered numerous honors and awards, including being named the youngest laureate of the Gutenberg Prize for her oeuvre, or her body of work. Among her other honors is the Leipzig Book Fair's prestigious designation of weaving as metaphor a book about artist Sheila Hicks as, quote, the most beautiful book in the world, which has got to be the best honor. <laughs> I think that needs a sash. <laughs> Um, her varied clientele includes museums and galleries, such as the Rijksmuseum Amsterdam, the Boymans van Bunigen, and the Apple, as well as <clears throat> manufacturers and retailers, such as Vitra and Camper, organizations such as the United Nations and the Netherlands Architecture Institute, and collaborations such as those with landscape architect and designer Petra Blaise of Inside Outside. It might seem somewhat anachronistic to focus on book design as we witness the collapse of so much print media, newspapers, magazines, and of course, book publishing itself. However, I was pleasantly surprised to come across this passage in a book by Japanese designer Kenyahara. Quote, thanks to the rise of electronic media, paper can finally behave as it can and should, as an intrinsically charming material. If electronic media is reckoned a practical tool for information conveyance, books are information sculpture. From now on, books will be probably be judged according to how well they awaken this materiality, because the decision to create a book at all will be based on a definite choice of paper as the medium. Please help me welcome Irma Boom. Thank you. Thank you. That was very nice. Thank you so much. Uh, the books are here, Andrew was talking about. But first I do, um, I have to tell you something and present my thoughts. And I want to thank uh, Andrew and the AIGA and the Walker Art for inviting me. So another short introduction. I'm an Amsterdam-based graphic designer. I worked for five and a half years. I went for five and a half years to the art school in Enschede in the Netherlands. It's very close to the German border. I studied painter, painting, but later transferred to graphic design. After art school, I worked for five years at the government publishing and printing office. Uh, most, the most dullest place you can ever work. <laughs> Guys with beards, I saw a person with a beard, so sorry, but all the designers had beards and, and <laughs> then drift everywhere, and, and suddenly I was there. Um, but I learned a lot there. In 1991, I started Irma Baum office. I work for national and international cultural and commercial commissioners. I never say clients because I, I think the situation in, maybe in the Netherlands is different than here. I think here in the States you have a client, but I think that I work with a commissioner. It's a, it's a difference. Since 1992, I'm a senior critic at Yale University's School of Art, and so next week I'm there at Yale. This year, uh, not this year, in 2007, the Museum of Modern Art acquired a substantial part of my oeuvre for the permanent collection for the Department of Architecture and Design, which makes, uh, so I, I worked, I had a lot of commissioners in the Netherlands, but since the MoMA uh, acquired my, uh, my work, I think from the 250 books they, I've made, they acquired uh, 60 or 70. 
And since then, I have a lot of work in, in the Netherlands, so that's really uh, funny. You have to be known and recognized outside your country. Here we have some thoughts about my practice. I honor the traditional book, but do not want to stop there. My ambition is to develop the significance and the limits of the book. Structures that come from new media, the way text and images are treated, have given the book a new impulse. It is important to experiment and not to be afraid to sometimes to create utter failures. The book can keep its vitality. There's a lot to explore in a technical way, and even more importantly, in terms of content and form. Happily through books, the past, present and future can take on profoundly contemporary results and become part of our everyday. My role in making books is to give another life to a story. Working with different worlds, exchanging thoughts and ideas is one of the most valuable ingredients in my practice. What has always been important to me is the complete trust of my commissioner. I immediately drop my pen if there's no collaboration and if I feel we're not on the same track. No use to continue. But if it works, then the object that we collectively created hopefully pushes the boundaries of the definition of a book. And I must say, I'm very lucky that I have so many good commissioners. The role of the designer has changed in many ways. The designer has become more an author, not just serving a commissioner's need, but being part of a total creative process, raising new questions, looking for unusual answers. I love, I love the industrial made book. I don't like, I used to say I hate the handmade book, but that's maybe a bit too strong, so I now say I don't like the handmade book. <laughs> love big print runs, the democracy of the book. I've collected a list of words which represent my thoughts or definition of what books should be. And I only will read a few because I have many, many, many words, many, many, many. And, and you don't want me to read that. That's really boring because I did it in alphabetical order. I, I once did it at a, a, in London and they were really waiting for me to get at Z. So uh, I don't do that. Accurate, uh, antidote, uh, art, um, bizarre, beauty, brilliant. Uh, democratic, courage, uh, composition, gesture, generous, humor, hybrid, imperfection, independent, uh, innovative, inspiration, instinct, int intuition, intrinsic, um, knowledge, laboratory, just to name a few, minimalism, uh, mood, uh, navigation, oasis, paper, philosophical, power, problematic, respect, um, seductive, sinful, sex, suspect, time, thought, tradition, upside down, weird, and zen. I think I, s so that's my reading part, so that's done. Uh, now it's all improvised. Um, so um, there's also an important thing. It's this whole stellage, which is fantastically made by the technicians of the Walker Art Center. Thank you for that. And uh, I always bring the real books, because if, if you show it on a PDF or on a, with a PowerPoint presentation, it doesn't work. So all my books are a bit worn because I always travel with them. And I don't have so many books, no, so not so many copies of all the of all my work, so they're a bit uh, old. These books are really old. I made them in 88, and uh, so 10 years later I met Andrew, I think, in 98. So uh, they're already 22 years old, and if I look at them, when I, when I made them at the government printing office, so at this beard uh, studio, <laughs> um, I thought, um, they were ugly. They were such ugly books. It's just before the computer time. Not that I'm that old, but it's just made before the computer uh, uh, was becoming normal. Um, and it's all about these uh, stamps, special stamps uh, published in the Netherlands. And if you get this commission, um, it's a special commission because all these guys like Wim Krowell, of course you know, I guess, famous Dutch uh, designer, Karel Martens or Gerard Hadders, you name all these guys, they um, have done these books. And suddenly uh, I got the assignment um, at the government printing office as a young girl to uh, make the stamp books. 
So everybody at the government printing office was uh, angry at me. And uh, because this young girl who just came in and just did a, did a few works suddenly got um, the job to do this. And then I thought, why, do I, why the hell do I get this job? And then um, the commissioner, actually the PTT uh, of the Netherlands, the royal PTT, um, said, well, we saw always these beautiful advertisements made for the other, for the previous stamp books, and we thought that designers should make now the books. And uh, it's funny because nobody wanted to make advertisements for the stamp books or for a, a, an advertisement at all. So I thought that's uh, also a good lesson to learn that sometimes you have to you do things because you have to do them anyway. And even if it's a small do job, a thing, a big thing can come out of it. So uh, so only because I did these uh, yeah these small marketing stuff, I got the job to do this. And basically, if you get uh, this assignment, you're totally free. Only the size is given. But I made the size, of course, um, wider because I have Japanese uh, binding. So I needed a centimeter more, which caused a real revolution in this uh, very traditional uh, uh, government printing office. All the state work was printed and published there. So for the events, for culture, for justice, you name it, everything. Okay, so this one centimeter was already a big uh, issue. Um, and then I thought, uh, working with uh, the art historian of the PTT, I, w I said, I want, to do, um, an, I want you to write an essay on inspiration sources. He said, well, that's a good thing. And he started to write. And I was looking for images. So he wrote a fantastic uh, essay on uh, copying, because his book is basically about uh, copying, or is it is something in inspiration source? And of course, that's very close uh, to each other. When do you copy, and when are you inspired? And then, uh, on the other hand, everything has already been done. So it's, it's a matter of context. and, and when time is also very important when you do things. So if you see Leonardo da Vinci, the fresco in uh, Milan in Italy, is basically copied by uh, Andy Warhol, but he made something else out of it. So he brought uh, the Last Supper from da Vinci into another, uh, into the to the, to the 20th uh, century. So he d added something to it. So that's in a way a good example, but I don't say anything if it's a good or bad example. Um, so it's just showing examples how the Alessi Espresso uh, coffee machine is very much inspired by a very old uh, uh, architecture or fresco. But uh, I made a, s uh, a funny mistake to put all the page numbers referring to all the captions. The page numbers are in the middle, on the, on the printed on the inside of the, of the pages. So you never know exactly where something is. So yeah, that's when you're young. And uh, I had no idea uh, what an effect a book can have. And that's what I found out when I made this book. These two books, because actually there are two volumes, uh, 87 and 88. And um, I found out that you uh, can have friends because you make books and that you get lots of enemies. So because of these books, suddenly I was this gray mouse working at this uh, government printing office. And since these books, everybody knew at least in the Netherlands and later outside the Netherlands, who I was. Also because the typography I used uh, is a total square. I was totally inspired myself by um, Malevich, the Russian painter, and by the black square. So I thought all the typography should be um, in, a, in a precise black square typeset. It was so before the computer, so I asked somebody to do it. A typesetting studio, and so there are no hyphenations, there's nothing. It's a precise uh, square. And only for that reason, I got so many, many letters from my colleague designers that they said, you cannot do that. It's really bad typography and this and that. But I had no idea. When I was making it, I was very shy. I was making it with my hair like this. I never look up, and I was always working like this. The audience didn't exist at all. Um, and also another thing is that uh, these books are basically made for stamp collectors because the stamp collectors want these are the stamps. 
want to know how the stamp came to a being. But whatever you wanted to do with the stamps was up to the designer. And uh, because I didn't like the stamps of these two years so very much, I thought, well, uh, I show the, pro the process of the design. Because the process is sometimes um, often more interesting than the final result. So I used this very translucent paper. And, and the less interesting sketches are on the inside, and the more interesting are on the outside. But, but if you look through the through the book, then you get an idea of of, some, of, of the making process. And for me, that was uh, very important. Um, and at that time, um, using a color, color Xerox as as uh, artwork was really bad. But I thought sometimes I was too lazy to have it first lit lithographed or scanned. Scanning was not the thing, it was lithography. So it was really made in an old fashioned, uh, in an old fashioned way. Um, so I sometimes went to a copy shop and make, made a four color Xerox on the right size. And then I thought, well, that's my artwork. And, uh, and so it's not always very good in color, but that was also not my point. I wanted to make a book what, what shows the process. And, 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 in, uh, and in the beginning of the, the book, the, the essay with all these examples about uh, art and about uh, design, how people get inspired, like this naked alphabet of Anton Beke, our famous poster designer, was inspired by an alphabet, a naked elf, a drawing of a naked alphabet of people with naked. How do you say that alphabet with naked people <laughs> from the 14th century? Um, and he was inspired by that. So it's it means that sometimes if you are inspired, if you if you copy something, it, it brings it. You can bring something to another level and into another. Uh, century into another time and I think that's really interesting and uh, nowadays in graphic design if, if you are inspired by somebody it's really bad but I think in science and in the academic world if some something if, is found or a research is done and if another scientist brings the research to another level that's very good and that's the way uh, science works, but in our uh, profession, that's not the case, and I think that's really bad, because um, yeah, everything already exists. Like here, for example, a poster from uh, 1929, and then Jan van Toren makes a stamp. I think in the 80s, and you see he's inspired, but it, but his poster looks, or poster his stamp looks like made in in the in the 80s and i think that's so interesting that 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 inspiration sources you need to know your 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 history to make uh, new things and that's what this whole book is about but as i told you it's for stamp collectors and stamp collectors uh, i don't know if i uh, i'm rude now but are the most dullest persons you can imagine <laughs> because who is who is collecting stamps anyways <laughs> Um, and they uh, they thought the books because they had the most of the books were, went to these stamp collectors, but I, but I didn't know, and I, I, of course I don't need to know, because if you know your audience too well, then uh, maybe you go a bit in the direction of the stamp of the, the stamp collectors, which I, of course I never would do and don't want to, and also not in my subconscious. Um, but they said we got uh, wrong books, so they wanted to have the books cut because they were the, the pages were closed and they couldn't look inside. So they were really angry. And, um, and so they wanted to return the books, and of course they did, and, and then they said we don't want ever again these stamp books because they are too crazy and too this and that, and I think yeah, they, you are too old fashioned, and you're not up to date. And um, Well anyway, it was uh, fantastic that the PTT, uh, Mr. Oxenar, uh, who designed our beautiful money, uh, let me do this. and. Um, yeah, and suddenly, uh, as I told you, I knew that I was in the world of graphic designers and that I had lots of friends, and lots of enemies. And that's a good distinction because suddenly, if people come to you for an, uh, for an assignment or for a commission, they know uh, what to get. And um, also, it's my first best designed book, and I never thought that these books were best designed, because best designed means that it's very well bound, and these books are not very well bound. They're stapled, because at that time they didn't know in the Netherlands how to bind 
uh, Japanese or Chinese or French folding or whatever name it has. And so they, they tear apart and uh, yeah, they're, the printing is not that good. But the concept, I think, is really uh, coming uh, across. So for me, um, when the books were done, when they were, uh, uh, when I got the first copy in my hand, I was not l happy at all, because the way I designed these books was a printed sheet. I didn't design a page; I designed printed sheets, or uh, yeah, uh, the 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 flat sheet. So I thought that this page would be on the left side, but when it, of course, when it's bound, it's on the right side, and I. Totally, uh, it misunderstood my whole uh, own concept, and but but basically it came out very well because <laughs> it'd be even better than than I would ever had designed because now the 18 is is uh, in a diagonal uh, because it's Piet Swart, Karel Martens, a Russian old label, a poster by Dunbar. So basically, the book I think is better than I ever could have designed, <laughs> and. And uh, and also because of the thin paper, the, the grid was um, always put things in the center because I had to do these books in three months, design and, and uh, image, uh, I had to image research the whole uh, shit, so to speak, uh, in three months to the end result and print it and bound. And uh, so I had to do something very simple and I think that really worked well. And I had no time to... Um, to, to do another concept because I was focused to get that thing uh, done. And when so w I was, I wanted to tell you when it came out, I was so disappointed. I gave immediately away uh, my first copies, but now I'm so happy that, that I've done that. I think I could never do these books again. Maybe that's why I spent so much time to tell you. It's really, uh, I was this innocent uh, girl and now yeah, I know that these books, of course, of course, cost too much money at that time. The budget was uh, 96,000 guilders, which is already a lot of money, but these books were 500,000 guilders. So it's extremely expensive. And then if you can imagine, you could buy them for 17 euros, uh, guilders, sorry, 8 euros, very cheap. So in dollars, maybe 12, Euro, 12 dollars or so. For 700 pages, not bad. Um, and then um, I think that this, I don't want to do it in chronological order, but this is the next book. Um, it's, a, it's the best book. It's the, the catalog for the best book designs in the Netherlands. Actually uh, inspired by the AIGA, I think, had the best books. Is that correct? In, in, the, in New York? for maybe 50 or 60 years ago, I don't know. And uh, so in Holland, we also have uh, the best designed books. And this is typically a job you get, at, at least uh, to design the catalog, if you're a young designer and if you're, um, yeah, and this is a one-off. You never do a best book catalog twice. It's a one-off. And what I wanted to do is uh, actually to make two books in one. And um, I didn't know how to do it. And since the experience with the stamp book, so that it came out all wrongly, uh, I make, make dummies. I make lots of models, small, big, whatever. I made all, make always dummies. And when I was preparing uh, this book, I made a dummy and I found out something really simple. If I flip the book this way, so this is made in 189, so also 21 years ago. I'm really old. Um, um, so it's you see the images here, the, best, the, the awarded books, and they're all uh, photographed in the same um, or in a proportion like a camera, like here. So if a book is small, <coughs> the the reproduction is small, and if a book is big, of course the book looks bigger. So it's all it's more or less like an exhibition in your hand, but if you do this, you see only the insides of the book. And it's typically something I found out by, by uh, making models. And it's a very simple trick, but a very effective trick. And also what is funny to find out that lots of designers don't read. I don't know what if you read, but lots of designers don't read. So many people, many colleague designers thought that this was the book. They never turned the pages like this, because then you see that there is text. You can read all that text, and the text is really interesting. 
It, one of my books is also um, awarded here. I, I actually have it with me. It's this book. And um, they say something about uh, how bad it's designed. <laughs> and, but they said it's such an interesting experiment that it should be rewarded. And you see, what would I ask the, 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 the collective, the, the, the organization, say the IAGA of the Netherlands, to give me the full transcripts of the, what the jury has said. And I also wanted to add the names of Gerard Hadders or Karel Trebers, of all the jury members. But they didn't allow me to, because it's really, uh, it's, if you read it, then you think, why are books best designed? Because what is best designed? Um, and as you know, in Holland, the, the, the idea of the concept is, is, is on a high level. So sometimes the execution is, like the stamp books, is not that good. But maybe the concept is good. So what is a best designed book? And I thought it was interesting to have the full transcript, no censoring, uh, in this um, best designed book. So you, you see, uh, um, you can read in this jury report that somebody, one of the jury members want to uh, withdraw if this annual report doesn't get uh, an award. And so that's really, it was really interesting for me to read. So, uh, and, and I think for everybody, but it's a pity that lots of designers uh, yeah, don't read. So um, please do. And another thing is that uh, I made a book um, very soft. It's a book about awards, but it's also relative if you win a prize. It depends on the jury, if you get a prize or not. And what for me was interesting to use this uh, material, at that time uh, it was only uh, wallpaper material and we had a huge sex club in the Netherlands, in Amsterdam, called Jap Jum, and they used this as wallpaper. <laughs> and I thought it was interesting to have that for a best book design, to have this sort of sex club uh, material. <laughs> Um, this is the annual report which uh, got this uh, award with uh, lots of people not liking it. So it's also an old piece, um, but one of my favorites, actually maybe the, my really favorite um, piece I've brought today. It's uh, also uh, falling apart uh, almost because I only have one more copy left of all these people who want to collect my books like the MoMA, which of course is very nice, but then at some point I don't have copies myself. It's an annual report for uh, the Art Council in the Netherlands. You know that we, I'm from, I'm Dutch, I'm from the Netherlands, and we have this subsidy system. So every project I show here basically is subsidized. That's why the cover doesn't have to look like a cover. This doesn't have to look like a selling cover, because uh, it is totally, subsidized and it will sell any way they think. Uh, it's, but this uh, art council, it's from the Ministry of Culture, is deciding who gets the money. If the Jan van Eyck, an art school, gets uh, 2 million or 10 million. And uh, so it's very important. And when I got this job, uh, I knew I could make two annual reports. And the first annual report I made like a Bible. So that is with uh, Bible paper and gold on the edges, etc. And the second one, which was really a sort of experiment, a um, uh, lot of uh, uh, questions were in the parliament about that annual report, which for me was of course interesting that in the parliament of our, of our country they talk about design, bad design. <laughs> and, um, and this annual report is about color. So here I did it something different. And what I, and what I also found out that these, this, this commissioner was very arrogant. They said, well, this annual report, the text is basically the same as the previous one you've designed, so go ahead. And I think if you say go ahead to a designer, and certainly uh, at that time to me, uh, I did go ahead. So I thought I'd do a totally... Uh, um, uh, conceptual piece. Um, in this annual report, it's all about yellow, red, and blue. So no black is, uh, you see text, but it's not printed in black. It's all printed in yellow, red, and blue. 
And so the headings, uh, I left out the blue, so you get a red heading, or for a subheading, the magenta is left out, or for the page numbers, it's only cyan. For the um, uh, paragraphs, I have a typographical square of white, and I always filter spread. So always, if you have a text, this is about Kernraad, whatever that is, it's always uh, filled with text. Here's another text, and so I always feel a spread. So if there's a lot of text, the type is small, and if there's not so much, much text, the text is big. And also, um, the Art Council have seven uh, departments, and with yellow, red, and blue, you can make seven, seven se uh, color com combinations of yellow and red, yellow and blue, etc. So always, it's, uh, a text is divided, but our department is divided by a color combination you can make with yellow, red, and blue. And always the text is filled. And it's printed on very thin paper. That was also important to me because what I wanted is that the, the printing, the yellow, red, and blue on top of each other is not matching so that you get this little um, bit of red misfitting or a little bit of blue misfitting. And I thought it was really nice. But the printer, of course, wanted to have it exactly on top of each other because then you have a sort of black. And I always had to encourage him not to do it so precisely. And uh, that's very difficult, of course, for printers. So, um, but anyway, um, this was, uh, I knew it was my, you see a lot of text on the spread. That's for the department theater. They had a lot to tell, so text is small. And here you, you have uh, yellow, red, and blue on top of each other. And the most important part of the annual report is where all the subsidies go to. So that's like a sort of uh, computer printout. Um, so printed in blue, and here you can see that one uh, got a million or another per got, got 100,000 guilders or whatever. And um, so this is basically the most important part, which is uh, very legible or readable um, uh, laid out. So, But in the end, um, yeah, I think because I also made, I never made a dummy or a model for it. It's just made as a... As a uh, on an A4, A4, I made the, the the instructions for the typesetter and for the printer, and that was that. I thought it was really uh, interesting. Um, uh, talking about color, so this was about color. Color uh, plays an important role in my work. It always comes back in an, uh, in a different uh, book or person almost. Um, this is a book I did for the graphic uh, or Royal Graphic uh, Printing and Binding Society in the Netherlands. Since 1913, they uh, make uh, it, it, our book comes out uh, during Christmas. The, we call it a Christmas issue, Kerstnummer, and um, it's always um, an issue uh, about. It, it was always an issue about printing and binding, but the last. I think 15 years it was always about printing and mobility or printing and this or that, but always subjects not related to what uh, printers do, namely printing and binding. And so when I got um, the job uh, to make a cast number, um, I thought, well, I do, I do something about color. And um, because if I go to Yale, um, I always visit uh, the color library of Mr. Faber Buren. It's a beautiful library with only books on color. And I thought, well, I want to make a book on color. But uh, I realized it was really a trap because books on color, every subject is already done. And uh, so what, what else can you add to it? And I didn't want to make a scientific book. I wanted to do something from a design perspective. And uh, as I mentioned in my introduction, uh, I wanted to become a painter. So I thought, well, why not do something with uh, fine art and color? And that's basically what I did. Uh, something extremely simple. I chose 80 artists, which I like very much. That's from Josef Albers to Solowit, Roy Lichtenstein, Julian Snabel, to uh, William Turner, to Leonardo da, da Vinci, to Andy Warhol, or Miro, you name them, 80 artists from four centuries. And from those uh, artists, 
I, t I made color diagrams, but if you get this book, because it's also for the binding society, I thought you have to open this book. So the book is closed. Oh, I have to show it like this. It's, it's the edges are uh, with perforations, of course, you have to open it. So if you buy this book, you only see flat colors. And um, also this is, uh, I always have this experience with all these people who are have a subscri subscription to a book, like the stamp books. Also, people have a subscription to this Christmas issue. And uh, when they got this book, they only saw these flat colors. And as I said, designers or people related to it, they don't read. Everywhere it said you have to tear open the book to see the beauty. It's everywhere mentioned. It was on the box. It was everywhere. Please open it with your hand or with a blunt knife. Nobody did, of course. And because if you do it, then you see what I basically did. So I made from Joseph Albers a color diagram. I made from uh, Karel Appel, a Dutch artist, a color diagram. But always, if you see the flat color, it's always derived from the four color printing. So this is for color printing and the color diagram. And this is a special mixed color by the graphic industry for me. So this is a real, Carol apple color, or there's a real Joseph Albers uh, blue. And so that's the whole book. You have to open it to see the beauty, because otherwise it's just these flat colors. But the moment you open it, you see Matthew Barney, or you see uh, Max Beckman, or Jean-Michel Basquiat. That's also a thing. I, uh, all the, the, the 80 artists are put in chronological order because uh, then you get a sort of coincidence uh, who is next to each other. Because if I had to invent who is coming next to each other, then it becomes so too precise. And now it's a sort of coincidence, which in my work is very important and much nicer also for me to, to, to see it. Um, so when the book came out, it's it, like I said, exactly like the stamp book, people didn't know what, what it was. And they said, well, this Irma Baum person, she made it something very uh, simple. She, she just made uh, 160 colors. And uh, what is this? And they didn't understand. But the more people started to opening the pages, the more this book uh, came into, into the world. And... I think for Dutch standards, there are 8,000 copies printed, so that's really a lot. But basically so, uh, sold outside the Netherlands. And also a person from Hollywood saw it. And he was so interested in these stripes that he decided to make uh, a DVD about the stripes. It made the stripes come alive. And um, I thought it was nice. And, uh, and also because if you make it uh, in, in, um, alive, it's nice that you can have it uh, sh see all the stripes in alphabetical order or in chronological order or randomly, wh whatever you want, how you want to see the stripes. And Michael Nyman, the composer, he made uh, music for it, six seconds. Really uh, not so many, but if you hear it, you think it's, he made hours of music for me. Um, oh, is this Van Gogh? Oh yeah. Um, and this is the Van Gogh. Um, so, and that's really nice. Uh, the DVD is, I think, still for sale. And also Peter Seville and John Maeda uh, have a color piece on the DVD. And, and it's really nice. It's a sort of ambient thing. I think the W Hotels at some point showed uh, these uh, videos. If you would enter the room, the hotel, you could see the stripes. Um, and I also, I think... Uh, Jet Blue is an airline here, also had it at some point. Um, but it, it's very funny that uh, so a, a, projects, uh, a project like this has a very slow uh, uh, success, but in the end it be became my, um, one of my best books because lots of people told me at some point, hey, it looks like a wallpaper book, which I totally agree, it looks like a wallpaper book. So suddenly I'm also in the wallpaper business. I sell, uh, uh, this is Holzer and, and Holbein, I suddenly sell uh, wallpaper. And even in the Van Gogh Museum, uh, they sell the Van Gogh uh, wallpaper. And also the Hilton Hotel in, in Amsterdam has a Van Gogh uh, hotel room, which I also decorated. <laughs> so 
and lots of people say, why are you doing that? You're a book designer. You're not in this hotel making this Van Gogh room. But I thought it was ex yeah, really fun. And also because of the, the MoMA, so the Museum of Modern Art in New York, uh, introduced me to the Hilton to make this room. So it was not via the Netherlands, it was via New York that I got this commission and I thought it was really fun. So, um, but this book uh, is about uh, art. Oh, so, so still it's a very big uh, success for me. And also, um, finally, if all the designers finally cut uh, the book or open the book, you get these wonderful edges. Um, so this is a book about art, but I also now uh, produce a book about uh, UNESCO sites, which has a totally different color uh, scheme. You never see the word uh, kleur, which is, means color, because the word uh, kleur doesn't mean anything to me. This is uh, in Japanese. I always forget if it's iro or ira. It's much more exciting for me and, and uh, has more an inspiration. And also the German word Farbe is, is much more color for me than the wor word Kleur can ever tell me. Um, in the back of the book, because it had to be text, that was one of the requirements, is the literature list of um, the, the Faber Baron collection from uh, Yale. What other book? Yes. Maybe a quick book. This is a quick one. Um, I work uh, for the Dutch architect uh, OMA Rem Koolhaas in the Netherlands. Uh, in the beginning I did all these uh, three-day projects and I also must say I made it a three-day project because if, uh, if, you, if they do a competition uh, that takes of course a lot of time and in the beginning I was always wi working with the architects on the book but then I was for six weeks or for five weeks sitting at OMA and then making all these books and in the end they change so many times. It's much nicer if you only uh, work the last days uh, with them because then you get the final information and you can make a final book. And it's nice to do uh, yeah, a book in, in three days instead of five years or six weeks because it, it's, it's another energy certainly for this kind of books. Um, and it's always much fun to do this because it's a very close collaboration uh, with the architect. And uh, so I learn a lot from them how they uh, see uh, to make a narrative, to have sequences in book. And uh, I think that that's uh, very inspiring for me. And also to, to think more in a three-dimensional way and how uh, things work. So for me it's, it's very, uh, um, how do you say that, effective to do it. And um, my colleagues often said to me, how can you do that, these stupid competition books? And uh, But I thought, well, I, I never say something is not good enough for me. I can do anything if I learn from it. And I learn, learned a lot of, uh, I think, uh, yeah, I did 10 years all these uh, competition books. And now I'm doing other projects with the same architect. So uh, it's always also sort of rewarding uh, to do it. But I, that was not my purpose. The purpose to work uh, with the architect was to learn uh, how to make uh, sequences and tell in, in, in a limited amount of pages uh, a story. Um, a book, actually also a bit uh, an old book, it's my first uh, freelance uh, job, so in 1991, or 1990 I did it, right after finishing uh, my work at the uh, SDU, at the Government Printing Office. Um, the last book I did at the Government Printing bo uh, Office was a book called Art Meets Science and Spirituality in a Changing Economy. Nobody wanted to do that book because the word spiritual was in it. And in the Netherlands, they are not so spiritual. And they really didn't want, nobody wanted to do that book. And I thought, well, I'm leaving anyway, this government printing office. So let me do it. I thought just a quickie and uh, just do the job. And um, it was very funny uh, because um, I got to meet the Dalai Lama. I met uh, John Cage, uh, I met um, General Idea, I think only one person of the three, of the team of three, of the artists are is still living, but at that time they were all uh, three alive. So it was an enormous, interesting uh, experience. Um, but the book itself I never show because it's really dull, it's like a reader. 
and it's for the Contemporary Art Museum in the Netherlands. And I thought, well, it, it was just a reader. But, uh, with an, um, but the book was sponsored by uh, SHV, and SHV is a, is a multinational based in the Netherlands, owned by a family, the family van Vlissingen. And um, it was he who called me, so the sponsor of that Art Meet Science book, uh, if I could come to his uh, head office in Utrecht to make a book for him, because he liked that book so much. I was really surprised. I thought that's not such an interesting book. But he, well, he totally was in love with, with it. And uh, so I was invited to come to SHV and to meet this Mr. Paul van Vlissingen. I had no idea where I was going to. So I thought, well, I better put on some decent clothes and comb my hair. And uh, but when I finally got there, um, I met this wonderful person this Paul van Vlissingen. Uh, we immediately, after uh, talking to each other for one minute, we had uh, a sort of chemistry. And he said, can you make my uh, birthday book? I said, well, what a silly question, a birthday book. And he said, well, when I was 40, I had cancer. And now I become 50. And I want to give my friends, um, who still are my friends, because if you are ill, you lose a lot of friends. And the people who still are my friends, I want to give a book. And I give you a plastic bag of photographs of water and a plastic bag of mountains. And I wish you a lot of success. That's what he said to me. So, well, and drawings, he's, he's a businessman. He's the head of, he's a, the CEO of, of a multinational. And then he, he's also a photographer and a, he makes drawings. I was a bit, but he is a businessman. He said, really, I wish you a lot of success and I see you next week. And I hear your plan. And I don't like yellow. That's also what he said. Oh, okay, <laughs> fine. But I said, at least tell me your date of birth. And he said, that's March 21, 1941. Not that I'm so very spiritual, but if you count these numbers, and according to Indian num numerology, he has the numbers 333, three, three, which means he's a genius. And he is, I must say. I worked with him another 16 years until his death. Un until his deathbed, I made uh, the last book with him. He finally, uh, unfortunately, died of uh, pancreatic cancer, so it was really sad. But here it was all fun and having, uh, making books. Um, so I thought, and he wanted to have a book with 50 pages, which of course is very silly. If you're a philosophical man and then you want to have a book with 50 pages, I thought, no. So I did everything with his date of birth. So I, uh, from all the thousands of drawings he gave to me of, of mountains, I chose 21 drawings and I repeated them three times. So all the times you see one drawing uh, repeated. If you turn the page, you always see the drawing another time. And I created with all these drawings of mountains a new uh, landscape for him. So the virtual or sort of non-existing landscape. And I chose 41 um, uh, images of water. But then I thought, I made this. I thought, what, I, what am I doing? What is, what is this book about? So I asked him, and he said, well, what do you think? He said, well, I, I, I don't know. <laughs> I see mountains, and I see water. And he said, well, that's the whole point. You, see, uh, you can see and hear mountain, uh, water changing, but mountains change the same, only you don't see it. But they do change over time. And I said, well, if that's your point, then you have to write some philosophical text about your life. And then he said, and he, and he did. He's a CEO. Uh, the next day, I said, I need uh, 21 texts because I had these 21 drawings. And the next day, it was all facts. Uh, I got uh, all the text uh, facts in handwriting. And I thought, well, what the hell did he write? I couldn't, he's, it was like a doctor, the handwriting. I couldn't read it. So we had another meeting and then he said, oh, well, he said, did you like my text? I said, well, I couldn't read it. It's totally illegible and, uh, and it needs to be typeset. And he was so upset about it that I said it. So everybody loves my handwriting and, and who are you to tell me that it's not legible? I said, because I cannot read it. It's simply I cannot read it. And if I cannot read it, then, then the idea doesn't come across. So anyway, so well, please have at least your secretary uh, type, typeset it or uh, type it. 
transcribe it so that happened. But I didn't uh, say so many things about it. I thought I'd just typeset it and put it in. Um, another thing was that it was my first job after the government printing office. And what I got as a present from the government printing office, if you don't believe it, is a package of A3 paper. So it's actually this size of paper they gave me as a present. Very silly present. <laughs> but I also got the table uh, with it. So a table and a package of A3. So, and when I started to do the book, it's just folded A3 paper. I don't know exactly this. You have also a big size. It's not letterhead, but the double. And uh, so this is basically what the book is. And uh, as I said, I'm, since those stamp books, I always made these dummies. And then I thought, well, what should I do with this? I thought I'd put in yellow. I put all yellow colors on the inside because he doesn't like it. And you, you should know that this Mr. Van Vlissingen is a very aristocratic, was a very aristocratic man. His family is older than our royal family in the Netherlands. So don't fool with him. And nobody fools with him, nobody. But I thought, well, I'm this person coming in and then I do this book and I'm out of his life. So I can take some risks. And um, so I thought about his yellow, and, although, and also he was always, uh, he was a big fan of, uh, of her, of Madonna. <laughs> and I was totally surprised, totally surprised. So when, uh, when, and I thought, well, of course, maybe I'd put in the, the, the yellow, or I put in some other images related to the outside of the book. So that's finally, or basically what I did. So there's always, the inside images are another level of re reading, but they tell a story in itself. Um, then the paper is uh, the paper is coffee filter paper. Of course, you don't print on coffee filter paper. You make coffee, so that's asking for trouble. Um, so, um, and I did some proofs, some press checks, wet proofs with uh, for this book because I thought I had, cannot take a risk with uh, Mr. Van Vlissingen. If it's a lousy job, then, uh, then I'm fired. Or whatever, I don't know. Um, I'm looking for, uh, again for Madonna. And, um, and he uh, said, I wanted to ha go to the press, because it was one, his first book ever. And he said, I want to, to uh, go with you to the to have a press check. It was totally in the south parts of the Netherlands. And uh, so it was a long, at least for Dutch standards, two and a half hour drive. It's then you're almost out of our country. Uh, and the length, in that way, which it's two hours, and then you have had the Netherlands. You know, the Netherlands is tiny. Um, anyways, uh, so he went with me to do the press check. And to make it worse for him, I started to print her, I asked the printer to start with the Madonna sheet and um and it was very funny he said well what the hell are they printing i come for my own book and not for this madonna thing well i said it is your book he said but madonna is not in the book so it is it's a surprise image <laughs> <laughs> and he he of, he uh of course he he had to smile and he had to smile even more because the printing didn't work out because his this coffee filter paper is very porous and the paper came out like whipped cream so it was really a big disaster and uh, but in the end he liked it so much that uh, yeah we he always when uh, a project was coming to an end like this book he said well can we do another job together and uh, so i worked with him uh, until his um the, uh, when he was dying we made the last book about the the three meters around him. So we did another uh, last book, which his friends got when he, uh, after the, the funeral. So it was really very sad, but it was for me an extremely good experience to work with a person uh, like him. I've showed the book so many times that it's falling apart. Here's his handwriting. It's totally not legible. <laughs> so the, and it's all the friends. Um, but I think also that the book falls apart is of course a pity, but on the other hand, it's very, uh, that's, I, I make books you have to use. Um, when I, uh, Angeletia, a French artist, I think I have to speed up, um, asked me to do a book for him, I showed him my work. And I always count the books if I show my work somewhere because I don't have, as I said, not so many copies. And he liked this book so much that he stole it. 
And of course, I said, I miss one book because I always bring 20, 21 bro books. So um, I had to give it back to me. And I thought, well, um, I make a book like that for this artist. And because also his work was about uh, arrangements. And uh, I thought it, so I did the sort of same folding, but, uh, but the binding is different. And uh, by uh, making a, a book with foldings uh, like this, you can all the time make different arrangements. And I thought that was uh, very appropriate uh, for him. Just whatever way you um, yeah, turn the pages, it's always, uh, it's always different. And uh, another thing is that uh, I, I, sometimes I think that, I, that my commissioner let me do this, that this image is mirrored on this side. I think, what a job. And why, I think now. But at that time, I was really convinced to have the image mirrored because the arrangement, the meeting of the image is then on the edges. So it was really sort of a um, thing that I thought, well, that my commissioner let me do it. Also, there's no text in this book because Angeletia didn't want any text. And I thought, well, I agree with him. So there are really large fold-outs and large arrangements you can make. I think I never do this kind of books again because it makes me very nervous to fold them back. <laughs> and and it's always oh, it's, it's it's something you have to do once and then uh, you've done that and that's it. Um, but on the other hand, uh, of course, the art institution in The Hague wanted to have text, so the text is on the cover, on the inside of the cover, and on the inside of the of the dust jacket. So all the text is here. Three languages is really a lot, a lot of reading. Yeah, that's also difficult. You, you don't have that in, in your, here in the States. But we're this tiny Holland. We always have to put text in Dutch and in English. And if the artist is French, also in French. So it's always this uh, bio, trilingual uh, um, problem you have to solve. Here it was, uh, I didn't have to solve the language problem because it was a book for storefront in New York for the artist uh, or the architect or designer um, Petra Blaise inside outside yeah. it's a very old piece and it's basically the same as the best designed books it's the same system but uh, designed in a different way um, this is so if you look uh, through this book on this side inside you see, see all her inside projects all her curtains and floors and mainly curtains she has designed and if you do this you see all her outside projects so all the gardens uh, parks whatever she designed on the uh, on the outside and then you also see that there are holes in the book because uh, the company is called inside outside and the inside and outside always have a relation. So always inside and outside uh, should be visible. It's also not easy to make a book with holes. <laughs> because a book with holes doesn't bind, you cannot bind it. But uh, as I said, I may always make dummies myself. I thought, and I have the, the, the sort of uh, science. If I can make it by hand, then a machine can do it much better in an industrial way. So, um, but it was really problematic. When uh, Petra Blaise had the show at Storefront, uh, I was at Yale and the printer called me and the binder called me, we cannot get this book bound and we cannot have the holes in it. Well, I said, the holes should be in it, come on. That, that's, uh, that's, that's a demand. And um, so the holes were in it and then he said, we cannot bind it so well. That's what I learned from Mr. Van Vlissing. I said, oh, I wish you a lot of luck with the problem. And I see the result. <laughs> in, uh, at the opening of the show. And uh, so that's what happened. So they could do it. They only had to go to another machine. And so uh, I think it's when uh, things are problematic, it's also interesting that you help the, the, the graphic industry to reinvent themselves. So, and basically they were very proud and very happy that, uh, that finally the book uh, was done. I did another book for Petra Blaise, but I think uh, this tiny book is much nicer. Uh, and the book is tiny, it's a 25%. 
uh, because at that time uh, digital images uh, were like this. So I couldn't even make a big book for her because the quality was so bad. And uh, this book is white and I think it's very nice when it becomes uh, dirty. Okay, a black book can also become dirty. Uh, this is a book I did for uh, the Design Museum in Zurich. It's called Wertewandel, uh, which means uh, change of value. This uh, strange object, uh, it's a book about four collections of the Design mu Museum in, in Zurich. So a design collection, in uh, industrial design collection, what else? All these design collections. Um, and I thought, uh, because it's uh, about change of value, I thought I'd put this, uh, this um, thing, this object, it's a spaarschäler. You can peel very thin uh, potatoes or carrots. And I thought it was a Dutch invention because of uh, peeling it so thin, you know, that the Dutch don't want to spend too much money, and etc. And I thought, well, it must be a Dutch invention because you can buy it everywhere in the Netherlands. But it's Swiss. And, uh, be and maybe the Swiss are, have the same. But in Switzerland, you can not buy this uh, not only in aluminum or plastic, you can also buy it in gold or silver or platinum or titanium. And uh, so there it became really uh, a cult object. When I got this commission, they asked me to make uh, a, a, a book with 144 pages with the four collections uh, of images with their four collections. It's the first time I opened this book because I really unpacked it. I brought it brand new with me. Um, and I thought, well, uh, 144 pages and then you have a collection with 5 million pieces. I think at least the book should, uh, uh, should be a manifesto of the bigness or the amount of the, of the collection. So I uh, came with um, a model. The model was basically uh, this, like this. And uh, I proposed to them to make a, a, f a small fat book with a lot of images. And they said, oh, you cannot do it, and it's very expensive, and this and that. And editorial board was, of course, really against it. And um, so they said, we need to talk to our director, because this, y y y we ask you for 144 pages and not for... 864, etc. And uh, we cannot afford it. was all complaining, complaining. But I didn't say anything. It's also a trick. Don't say anything. Don't say, oh, it's not so many. Or I didn't say anything. And then they said, we need to talk to the director of the museum. So, yeah, that's a good idea. It's always good to, to have the director involved because the director can decide. And the director saw the book and he said, yes, we do it. I love it. We are going to look for a publisher and uh, go ahead. So the, the editorial board was really sort of <laughs> having their heads hanging down because, yeah. <laughs> well, anyway. Um, so they let me do it. And I had, uh, I think, six months to, to do it, to, uh, to, go, to uh, go through their collection and do the image research to, to make a book. Uh, with a very specific sequence. So I was looking always for, in, because the museum have, has not that super, like the Museum of Modern Art uh, collection, but a bit of it's more a B quality, I think. And uh, which I think for me is very interesting because this is not an, per se a very beautiful object, but next to this one with this high thing in here, it's, I think it's very nice and interesting to see. So it makes you, Basically, it makes you uh, smile if you turn the pages. So for me, it's a book anyway is turning the pages. But also, it's interesting. When I was look doing my image research, I didn't look at dates. I had no clue uh, what the captions were. I had no clue that this was from 1900 and this is from 2000. So that there's 100 years in between these images. It's hard to believe, but it's really true. And uh, so in the end, when I added the captions uh, to the images, then I saw, oh, it's, it's sometimes 500 years uh, with a difference. And, and I thought that was also the fun. So for me to make an image sequence to tell a story uh, via uh, associations or maybe symmetrical or color or pattern or whatever. So it's really turning the pages and, and having having fun, and also getting to know uh, the collection. 
And um, so, yeah, this, this was, uh, like I said, really a big job to do, but also so much fun. And there's one thing I want to show, and then I think I have to do it more quickly. I think it's very interesting to have uh, Obama here next to, uh, to Bob Dylan. But if you turn the page, I think it's really, it's, that's how you see how black people were used. So the Walsheim niggas, it's really bad. And, uh, but then I go from using a black person or Negro, they say here, that people are used into other stuff. So it's all these stories uh, which are uh, told by looking uh, as, uh, at, the, at the images, uh, totally looking at what you see. And I must, yeah, I can continue. It's a whole book through, and in the middle there is text from Paola Antonelli, from Glenn Ad Adamson, from the Victoria and Albert, from the um, Design Museum itself. And so, and I think that's, that's really nice uh, to have the text somewhere in the middle. So I made epilogues and prologues, very, ex yeah, a lot of images. And yeah, I must say a lot of fun. And I think it's very important that you get a sort of idea of the um, of the collection. Um, I do it more quickly. Yeah? Um, the a book again for Mr. Van Vlissingen. He um, he's a wonderful person, as I told you, was a wonderful person. He uh, sponsored uh, a sailing ship uh, to be built, a sort of. Um, how do you say that? The Eleonora, a big sailing boat, which was damaged, and he uh, funded uh, the renovation of the boat. And so he was asked by the owner to um, to make the first trip with friends uh, from Gibraltar to Rio de Janeiro with this enormous sailing ship. It was the first time that he had a digital camera. And he photographed everything on the, on the boat from day one to uh, two weeks or so later, he was photographing what was happening on the boat. His girlfriend and people fishing and eating and whatever else. If you cross the equator, they do all kinds of games and there's all this fun on board. And I couldn't stand it. So when I showed him uh, the design of the book, I thought, oh, how perverse. I thought it was really perverse. And um, so I thought, well, what can I do? And I showed him another book. You think it's the same. Basically, it is the same. But what I did was taking out the people. And suddenly, if you take out the people, you see all these seascapes, which look very philosophical. So suddenly, from a sort of perverse, very sort of touristic book, and sort of, yeah, silly uh, souvenir, it becomes only by taking out the people, you, you get this book which yeah has more uh, sort of philosophical idea about uh, looking into uh, into the horizon, and I thought that was so uh, interesting. And he also uh, realized it, and he said, "Well, we make both. We make both the books. We make a small book for the crew, and the big book for uh, for everyone." And so I think that's a wonderful uh, commissioner to have that you say we make both, not oh let's choose. No, he said. Whoop. We do both, and so he had this philosophical uh, seascape book, and and for his uh, sailing friends, he had, uh, yeah, more or less the the how do you say that the trip, and what was interesting for me because it was his first digital camera uh, photos, I could precisely put it in the, the order he photographed it, so that was also nice that it's really from Gibraltar to um, to Rio de Janeiro. So that was uh, was nice. Um, it's a very funny thing that uh, Mr. Van Vlissingen got for his book an uh, honorary doctorate. <laughs> I don't say anything. <laughs> um, well, anyway. Um, sometimes books are a success and sometimes they are a failure. I, I thought that this book I made for the Dutch designer Otto Treumann was really nice. But uh, the subject, Otto Treumann, didn't like it at all. Uh, it's a, a monography. Uh, it's the first book in a, uh, in a series of monographies about Dutch design, designers. And the idea was to have an old and a younger designer 
working together, or not working together, the younger designing uh, the book for the older designer. And um, so Otto was at that time, I think, 80, and I uh, was 10 years younger than now. Um, so 30, uh, somewhere in the 38 or so. And um, and I looked at the oeuvre uh, of Otto Treumann, and, and I realized that because he was a designer in another area, uh, and not area air, how do you say the other time? He um, era, eh? uh, he um, didn't design that much. And I thought, well, it's very easy to put all his designs on the cover. So what you basically see is all his work he's, he ever did is on the cover. So that's all these small images. It's still 700 images, and I had to cheat because I couldn't get it because it has to look a lot if the images are too big like on the in the inside it doesn't look that he worked a lot so i really wanted to have a lot on it so that you get the idea it's a major yeah he has a body of work and so so i took uh, um, posters he designed and then i took different parts and i took some uh, put some jokes in it otto treumann okay and his children are on the cover etc so, but I thought by turning the pages, I do an image image selection. So, if you if you see this, then already the things I didn't like here are out. So, by turning pages, I do, like I said, image editing. I do a selection, and uh, images become bigger and bigger and bigger. And I have to show where is a really big thing, bigger, and it it becomes bigger and bigger. Where is here the big pieces? So the wonder, uh, at, uh, at least I think the wonderful pieces, and in the end you see details of his work. It's almost actual size, and I thought it was extremely uh, beautiful. But actually, this part was what Otto Treumann didn't like. He said that I ruined his work by showing these enormous details. And now it's not ruining, it's zooming into your fantastic work and how precisely it's, it's made and the beautiful colors. It's an uh, enormous inspiration source, but he didn't like it at all. But it was funny because I made the book together with him and he saw the whole thing coming to a being. And uh, it was basically his, his uh, generation who didn't like it. I also didn't like it because the book is uh, soft. And they think that for a designer like, like Otto Treumann, you have to make a hardcover book. But I don't see that distinction. It's all about uh, content. And, uh, and the content of the book is actually really lousy. The text is so bad. It's extremely bad. So I made the text like a footnote. It's one big footnote. <laughs> I thought, how could anybody approve text like that? And it's so it's so badly written. So I tried to, to uh, with the image editing, to to lift it. So to show Otto Treumann here with our famous Mr. Sandberg, that he was inspired by Sandberg. He almost made a poster like that. That he was one of the monuments. It's a poster by uh, Otto Treumann. Here's Sandberg again. Uh, Mr. Keesbrusse, uh, Mr. Elvers, Dick Elvers, and Otto Treumann. So, so I really want to, uh, yeah, to put him in the in the right uh, context. Show his most wonderful posters. I think they're still, even now, they they look very good. He designed uh, stamps. This is a stamp, stamp like posters and posters like stamps. So that's what I'm showing. And um, he was a Jewish, so he's a Jewish background. Uh, you can see he was a member of AGI, which for him was extremely important. Um, here you see uh, Otto, a photograph by Otto Treumann photographing uh, Mr. Zandberg, so Willem Zandberg and Mr. Henry, and one of his big uh, uh, examples of that time. And then um, when the book came out, people said, and especially these old guys, so his uh, the old designers, why did you dedicate? Sandberg and Henry and swimming in a swimming pool. And why didn't you dedicate these pages to the work of Otto Treumann? And <laughs> I made a mistake and said, I couldn't find any other. So this was a very good and appropriate image. Of course, they thought, how arrogant. But I didn't mean it arrogant. It's more the world of Otto Treumann. He loved that AGI, the AGI world, because then you're one of the 
one of the guys. Um, and I was more looking uh, at screens. So he, he made a wonderful stamp about uh, our network, telephone network, a wonderful po uh, cover for a book. Then you see here Otto Treumann uh, with again Hendrian and Sandberg. Um, they are wearing almost the same shirts, but not exactly. They are different, so it's a coincidence. And I think I was more looking at that kind of uh, thing. So the whole book is not placed, uh, the images are not placed in chronological order. It's totally mixed, but you always see the date. And in the back of the book, there is a list of uh, with all the captions. But for me, it's more telling a story about the life of uh, Otto Treumann. And for me, it was really sad that he uh, first liked it and I showed him everything. And when the book was printed and his... Uh, yeah, a generation uh, colleagues, so how do you say that? Uh, same old designers. They said, well, uh, we don't like it. And I thought, well, pff, fuck you. <laughs> yeah, really? <laughs> I mean it. it was, I was so angry. Totally. I still get angry if I tell about that book. Um, so I skipped Fitra because I think otherwise it's too long. And I want to show the big book. Um, and I, of course I want to show Ferrari. Ferrari, uh, I love cars, I must say. And to do a book about Ferrari, the sports cars firm, is of course more a boy's dream than a girl's dream, I guess. But um, I w came back from holiday um, from Italy. And uh, if you come back from holiday, there's always a lot of spam. Now, of course, we have our iPhones, but at that time, uh, a few years ago, we didn't. And... Um, so I was checking all my email, and then you see all this Viagra and all that other pill stuff, what you get always in your email, and it's all this spam. And uh, there was also Ferrari sports cars, which I considered spam, of course, well, Ferrari. And I don't know the connotation here in the States, but in the Netherlands, if a person owns a Ferrari, then quite sure it's a pimp. Or it's a cocaine dealer, so it has a very bad connotation. <laughs> And um, and uh, so uh, I deleted, of course, the, the and then I thought, Ferrari sports cars. So I went back to the trash, and uh, I thought I need to read it. And I thought, hmm, it looks like a serious email because they saw a book I, I had done for contemporary African art with a professor from uh, Ithaca here from uh, the States. And uh, it was in Venice and uh, on the Biennale. And they said, well, uh, we saw that book. And is, do you think you can collaborate with us? And the first thing I was calling my boyfriend. So where is Ferrari based? And he said, of course, in Maranella, you stupid. <laughs> so, OK, I got this email from them. And uh, because it looked really real, and they said, uh, they, with an invitation to come to, uh, to uh, Maranello. And he said, call them immediately. And I thought, well, I don't. I don't. So I waited another two weeks because I really wanted to be sure. And uh, I really had a doubt that it was not OK. Somebody, w somebody was joking with me or so, or I don't know. Anyway, at some point I sent an email, yes, hello, I am this Irma Baum from that book, and I would love to, to, uh, do, uh, to work with Ferrari, and immediately they called me. Can you come tomorrow to, to Marnello? I said, okay. <laughs> it's only one or two hour flight, so okay, I'll come. And the ticket was at the airport, and uh, so I had to fly to uh, Bologna, and so uh, there would be a car to pick me up. What do you think? <laughs> Ferrari, of course. <laughs> that was really nice. And the guy who picked me up didn't, couldn't speak Engli uh, English. He could only say, fast or slow. <laughs> so, well, what do you think? Fast, is this a Ferrari or not? Fast and put. And off we went. It was fantastic. It, mar it was a, a Maranello with the engine, of course, in the back, and it made a horrible sound. <laughs> and it was really fantastic. It was my f uh, first time ever in a sports car. Yeah, of course, I've 
set in a Porsche. And, but uh, Ferrari is something else. And I immediately fell in love with uh, Ferrari. Also, and, and especially when they showed me the factory. And uh, that's fantastic how they make the, the cars. Uh, it, the fir at first, the people are dressed, uh, the technicians are dressed very nicely. It's really beautiful. And then they, you see how they make the car. It's actually how I make books and also, and also the, how they make an engine, how they, it was really beautiful. But then the problem was um, the material. They, so they said, okay, you want to work with us? Can you make a book? for uh, about all our engines. So of course I would love to do better the book about the engines than the car itself, I think, because the engine is basically the heart of a Ferrari, the en and of the heart of every car. And um, so I said, well, how do I get the material? Oh, they said, you find it. Said, no, how should I find all these engines of Ferrari? It was really a confusion and that went on, on for a year. That I was sending an email, when do I get the images? And they said, no, you have to design the book. Yeah, I said, I, have the, I designed the book, I need the engines, of course. So uh, that was really, really very, uh, yeah, really communication uh, thing. And in the end, I said, well, I cannot find all the images and I cannot go to, I, of course, I can go to internet and, and I don't even know what all what images you have. Of course, I know V8, but that there was V12 and inline engines. I didn't know, so I said I need help from a specialist. And I want exploded views, which I didn't get because it was uh, uh, secret uh, or classified information. So in the end, there was a guy in Torino, 80 years old, Mr. Rogliati, and he, as a sort of uh, fan from Ferrari. He had all the, the images of the engines. So finally I got in touch with him and he helped me find basically making the book. And it was really funny. And also again about something about sex because the, uh, there's a testa rossa you call this. And that's the cylinder head. But I didn't know testa rossa. Testa rossa in, in Amsterdam on the canals is again like Jop the, the it's a sex club that's called Testa Rossa. And of course, it's n named after a Ferrari. And I always, so my association was only a TR, a Testa Rossa, is very vulgar. But it only means that the cylinder head is made red. And Mr. Uh, uh, Ferrari could say when a cylinder head was red, that was his decision. So it's very special if a Ferrari has a, is a TR, is a, has a red cylinder head. So um, basically it was a lot of fun. And uh, so at some point I only did, I not only worked for Ferrari but also for Maserati. And Maserati is a very chic car in the Netherlands. So that's really uh, a difference. What sh how long shall I continue? <laughs> because I have these books. Do you want me to show it or not? Yeah. Okay, okay, okay. Okay, but I do it more quickly because I'm too... Uh, I take I spend too much. I already told you I can talk for hours, uh, which I should not do. Um, this is an annual report, so I do also very serious uh, things. For um, yeah, it's, it's also a bit of a joke. Uh, it's uh, Vitra I work for and Arend. And when I told Arend that it's I also work for Vitra because you always have to tell if you work in the same branch or in the same field uh, you have to tell uh, people and when I told Arendt that I work for Vitra they said oh we're a very good company but when I told Vitra that I also work for Arendt Dutch company they said well that's your problem <laughs> <laughs> that was really funny um, but anyway, this is an annual report and um, I ask, because the furniture is okay, but not like Vitra, of course. Um, so I, I didn't want to show in the annual report uh, the furniture, but I uh, ask... Uh, it's very bad, I'm very bad, sorry, sorry. I'm, I'm, uh, I, want to t I didn't want to tell, but anyway. Um, um, so I asked uh, five professors 
in a specific field to tell something about their inspiration source. Because if you ask a designer, you know what their inspiration source is. So I ask this Mr. Uh, Dorman, who is a professor of philosophy of science. I have no clue what that is, but I thought I ask him. So I didn't look who, uh, uh, how they looked. I was only looking what are they professor in creative thinking. This guy liked very much a uh, uh, goal made by Johan Cruyff, our famous football player. And this guy, uh, he explained to me why he liked a special theorem. He explained it completely to me and I thought, yes, I understand. But the moment we hang up the phone, it was gone. It was very, very complicated. But he agreed to have a photograph taken. Um, he, when he saw the annual report, he called me. He said, oh, I love so much my picture. <laughs> I said, I said, what? And, I, and, and I said, it's a wonderful picture, yes. But I thought, you can see he didn't shave very well. And yeah, he's not very handsome, I think. Well, anyways. Uh, this guy is socially, uh, Edward Bono is in there somewhere. Okay, but it's not so inter interesting. This guy is also interesting. He's a, a German professor for the environment and energy, for in the Wuppertal Institute for Climate, Environment and Energy, Mr. von Weizsäcker. And when I saw the photograph, and I also asked a photographer to make these very sharp, super sharp uh, technical camera Photograph, so you see everything, everything. And when I sh saw this photograph, I was really shocked because um, you could see that he didn't uh, brush his teeth. So there was all this spinach or whatever he had eaten before. There was all dandruff here on his head. He really looked very, very bad and almost ill. So I thought we cannot use the image unless. We Photoshop him, so he's totally photoshopped. But he didn't, he didn't say anything, I look beautiful or whatever. But uh, he's totally photoshopped because it was really too bad to have all this, especially the teeth, the dandruff, okay, but the teeth I thought was really uh, bad. But, but, but he was not photoshopped, he, that's really <laughs> Mister. Uh, a visual biography I did for a person called Fritz. And Fritz is actually the brother of Paul. And there are three brothers so of this company. It's Fr Fritz, Paul, and John. It's almost the Beatles. <laughs> um, and they're half British, so it's not so. Uh, it's anyway, um, so there was also a big competition because I, I always worked with uh, Paul, and suddenly I did some something with Fritz, which is problematic. You can imagine, that's a big competition. Um, anyway, uh, I asked Paul if I could do the book for Fritz, and Paul said, again, it's your problem. If you want to do it, you do it. It was not very uh, encouraging me. But anyway, Fritz is a wonderful person. And Fritz became 70, and his daughter asked me to, to make a book for Fritz. But she had one problem. She had. Uh, she wanted to make a Liba Amicorum, is that a book of friends? So Fritz was uh, um, saying goodbye to his professional uh, life. He wa was a, a member of supervisory boards of many big companies uh, in the Netherlands. And the daughter had asked all these uh, captains of industry to write a nice letter about her father. And um, so that was... Uh, the job she gave me. She said, I want to have a Liber Amicorum, a book of friends. And I thought, well, that's killing a book of, of friends. Because it's always the same story. Dear Fritz, you're a wonderful person, and, I, and I'm happy to know you all my life, and this and that. It's always the same. Other words, but always the same uh, message. And I thought, I said yes, and I, then I thought of Paul. He almost warned me not to do it, but I thought, oh, I have to solve the problem of all these letters to Fritz. And uh, then I was, I even could not sleep from it. I thought it's really a problem. And, uh, and then I thought, well, maybe I should dedicate really the whole book to Fritz. So it's Fritz here and it's Fritz there. Every photograph you see in this book is Fritz. 
and and all the 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 foldouts so um, are hidden and with all these Im these letters from all these captains of industry are on the inside. So if you don't want to see all these letters, you just turn the pages and you see Fritz. All documents from Fritz, Fritz when he was young, Fritz when he was studying, Fritz becoming uh, father, Fritz this and that, it's all Fritz. And, uh, and what was nice, it was, uh, I used the same paper as the stamp books, um, is uh, that suddenly these letters become very uh, poetic almost. <coughs> um, so from a sort of disadvantage, it became an advantage to have all this uh, material uh, on the inside. And sometimes it becomes really uh, very nice. And I think that um, it also was a big job. I must say, here you see, I don't know if you can see it, but all the letters are uh, coming through the photographs because of the thin paper. And uh, and I think that's that that's really nice. Um, but it was really a hard job for me to find all these Fritz photographs. So this is Fritz, and this is Paul when he was young. So this is the person I always worked with, and this only once. Um, to find always Fritz, Fritz, Fritz. And so, of course, I had already done this fat book. And um, so I knew already a lot about the family, but still it was very hard to... Uh, to always find interesting images and information about Fritz, if Fritz is getting older, and um, et cetera, et cetera. But in the end, uh, it's, yeah, it's this uh, visual biography, and there's also, uh, there are texts in it. And I asked the daughter to have, uh, because I had to find a sort of clue to handle all this information. And um, then we decided together that she would Every uh, seven years, she would have a sort of interview. About every seven years, she would have an interview. It's again Fritz. Uh, with her, Fritz. With her uh, father. And uh, Fritz. Fritz. <laughs> it's all Fritz. And uh, Fritz sailing, Fritz skiing. It's Fritz here, very handsome man. And um, Fritz on winter sport. Fritz, what is he doing here? Oh, he's at uh, being a CEO. I don't know. Anyway, um, Fritz in newspapers. Fritz having making funny faces at a the board of directors meeting. Fritz in, uh, initiated this beautiful calendar. Um, anyway, um, what did I want to say? Uh, so, and Fritz was also, as you see in the photographs, a big sailor. And so I thought for every seven years, I changed the color blue on the edges. And only when there is pink, there, uh, if there's another color, there's something happening. Here Fritz uh, meets his wife, uh, Marianne. And where the colored edges are, he gets babies. It goes very quickly in this book. Um, anyway, so... Um, <laughs> So that's uh, all about uh, Fritz. So it was very funny to make, but suddenly because of this book, which is not even for sale, I get all these people who want to have a visual biography. But uh, I thought I can only do, uh, could have done that for Fritz because Fritz was an extremely nice and intelligent person. He did not collaborate, I have to say, because I did it all with his daughter and, uh, and his uh, son-in-law. And uh, that was really fun. But some, some things you only have to do once in a lifetime. So Fritz is that. Um, Sheila Hicks, uh, an American artist who lives in Paris already, I think, for 30 years. Mm. She studied graduate and, and, and undergraduate at, uh, at Yale. And uh, she... Uh, or Josef Kudelka, a friend of her... Um, he uh, saw the stamp book. So the stamp books always come back in my story. <coughs> and um, Josef Kudelka loved so much the stamp books and he told Sheila Hicks, who's a textile designer. Do you know her? Is she f known in, in the States at all? 
Anyway, I didn't know her when um, <laughs> I was invited to work with her. I didn't. I had no clue. In the Netherlands, I don't think she was that famous. And um, but anyway, uh, so uh, I got to meet her. Uh, I went to Paris, and this is Sheila when she was young, and when she was in Mexico in 1960, and. Um, we decided uh, to work together because we, uh, she was already then 73 and she wanted to have this oeuvre catalogue and I thought it was interesting to make a book uh, for an interesting lady about her life, about her oeuvre, about her working life. And, um, but that if a book has no deadline, you don't have a book. And we were thinking about the oeuvre catalogue and we were thinking, and I made tons of models, many, many models. And at some point she said, I have an exhibition at Bart uh, Gallery in New York and uh, the, the oeuvre catalogue we cannot have ready, but maybe we can do a book only about my miniatures. And that's what we did. And then uh, for that reason, I did lots of experiments with uh, the edges. Maybe you can see it, the edges of, of books. And I thought that for her that was very appropriate to, uh, to use because she always told me if she sh uh, showed me her work that the edges are very important. So the selvage, I think you call it. And um, so basically that's what this book has. It has this a sort of unique selvage like her, like her weavings. And uh, I also asked her to write short uh, or a few lines about the weavings. She was a bit hesitant at first because she's not a writer, but I think she wrote very nice, almost poetry, how uh, some weavings came to a being. Um, but the best part uh, Sheila Hicks gave to me was when we started the project was this text about uh, from Arthur Danto about weaving as metaphor and model for political thought. When I had read that article, I knew uh, how important uh, weaving and textile is in our culture. So I wanted everybody to read that text. So um, I started the text with very big type. And if, the t if you turn the pages, it becomes smaller and smaller, and smaller, and smaller, and smaller, and smaller. And then from here on the text goes into uh, a specific type. I think it's 10 or so. And um, because I thought this text is, was so important for me to understand her work. And, um, but then it was really uh, problematic with Yale Press. Uh, as you know, in general, publishers are very conservative and also book people I think are very conservative um, so they didn't want to have this text so big and I even had it much bigger to, uh, to st uh, the, the starting of the text and then um, uh, they said Arthur Dante would never allow this that you, you play with his text or play with his text it's trying to invite people to read his wonderful text and I didn't know if Arthur Danto was alive. He said, well, is this person still alive? And they said, yes. So, well, show it to him. And so Sheila did. She showed it to Danto, and he loved it. He said, it's the first time my <coughs> text is presented in such a, yeah, inviting way. And so he said, it's brilliant. Let's do it. So I was so happy that the Yale people uh, couldn't uh, uh, stop me from doing it. <laughs> But uh, I don't want to speak too much about it because it was really a problematic uh, uh, process. But in the end, uh, for me, the, the object of the book is very important. The Yale Press always wanted to have a weaving of Sheila on the cover. And I thought uh, an interesting lady like Sheila needs a larger audience than only textile people. Imagine if there's a textile piece on this cover, then only textile people would pick up this book. And now because the book has more or less is a sort of object, it's, um, it's a very specific object which is only, yeah, it, it's made for her. I would never use it for anything else. And, uh, and I think that's interesting. Uh, and I, so I wanted to also to have a white book because the color is inside. And, um, but Jill Press said, we won't sell white books. So I thought another sort of convention. So who, tell, who the hell tells you a white book doesn't sell? 
uh, also black books don't sell. What, what's, what's the matter? And, uh, and I made hundreds of covers. And I said, I cannot do it because it, it's not good for Sheila. Sheila needs a more, uh, a more white book. And we can have her work on the back. But on the front, there should be a sort of interpretation of her work. And uh, that's much more a thing, an object for her, what helps her and serves her, than um, than putting a, a work of her on, on the cover. That it's it, and it's also not Sheila Hicks. Sheila Hicks makes huge works. This is just a collection of her miniatures. And uh, we were really in a fight. And I, I put off the book many times off the table. And I really didn't want to do the book anymore. And it was, well, I was really very sad. And in the end, there was no time anymore to, uh, to make another cover. They said, well, let's do it. So time saved me. And, um, and what happened? The book became an enormous success. It was the bestseller of Yale Press. And, <laughs> It, it was really very funny that it sold so many copies. And it's, I took this book with me where there's a handwriting on it. Just last Monday, the third printing is shipped to the, to the United States. And I think it's so funny that a book which didn't sell is already getting its third print. And they don't say anything at Yale Press. <laughs> <laughs> but I, I don't say anything. I say, well, nice uh, that the book sells so well. But, uh, no, it's, but, but it's very, uh, and, and it's, uh, what is very nice that it sells extremely well via internet. And that Sheila Hicks uh, also has a lot of profit of this book because, and that's what I think that, uh, of course, uh, I love internet. And for me, internet is so important. And I'm very happy that I'm a book designer in the, in the time of internet because uh, I think it's only possible to make a, such a specific book because we have internet. Otherwise, they would say, oh, don't do a crazy book like that with all this very specific uh, treatment of the edges. And... Um, but uh, because of internet, books are allowed to be a bit more an object. And, uh, and I think that's, uh, yeah, that's, that helped me a lot. Well, uh, two more books. This Chinese, there's a book in Chinese published about my work, but it's done. <laughs> well, you can just buy it somewhere. Uh, this is brand new, uh, brand new book. Uh, it's only released last uh, Friday. And um, it's a book for an artist. And I think it's extremely difficult to make a book for an artist. Like all these other guys, uh, Sheila, of course, is an artist. Yeah, I work for, uh, I've done more books for artists. But it's really difficult because artists already made the work. So what else can I do? And um, so what I uh, propose this artist to make again from uh, the work, uh, more or less, um, his painting. So this book is exactly in the same proportion of a painting of his. So the book becomes a multiple. It's a, it's a silk screen. And, this, and he makes his painting always uh, with six millimeters uh, on the edges. And it's also what is happening here. So everywhere you see uh, the edge. So if the book is on the ta table, it's almost um, uh, yeah, a, a, paint, a piece of art, a painting. Um, and what is very nice is uh, that the artist allowed me to uh, to just work with his work. I show very quickly what he does. He's an artist who makes uh, all these abstract paintings with uh, stripes and uh, yeah, with stripes. It's basically stripes what he uses. And I thought, uh, and I wanted to show all his work in the book. So what I decided was. Um, to uh, make a book, I mixed all his work, I printed it like uh, stamps, put it on the table, and tried to make uh, stories about hi with his work. So through time, every time there are departments in the book telling a story about his paintings. And uh, here is a small story about his paintings from different periods. And, um, and when I showed it to him, I thought he would never, never like it. Because I have all these paintings next to each other. He would never put next to each other. It's all in proportion. The whole book is in proportion. And, uh, and I showed it to him. But he almost got crazy. He said, well, I think I, I make good work. He really looked at his work 
if it was new, he said, I would never do this combination. How interesting. And he said, so I showed this to him. I said, he said, but how can you uh, continue? Because it's very hard, because all the work is, yeah, looks a bit the same. But uh, I always try to find uh, yeah, different uh, stories to tell. And sometimes there are these gatefolds. And I also thought it was nice to see his work, but also his work uh, in context. And then his work is hanging here next to a piece of uh, a work of Barnett Newman. And as a sort of coincidence, uh, I have the work, his very first work looks very much like Barnett Newman, I think. I think it is. <laughs> but then if you see this book, this is almost again a Barnett Newman. And it's also, it has a bit this dripping, like the, the painting I just showed you. So it has all these very nice coincidences. So sometimes a great fault with uh, his sketches. But basically what you see if you flip through the book is his work. And uh, there, of course, there's text, but all the reference images, if there is a reference... There are, are always gatefolds so with all the notes and, the, and these images on the inside. So basically what you see is his, uh, is his work, and uh, totally in, in, in proportion. And I thought it was, um, yeah, again, here a nice story about color. It's all about color, his work. So here all the yellow and brownish colors, and then it becomes bright. And um, so it was interesting to see uh, how it was a revelation and, uh, and, and, and a sort of new interpretation uh, of his work and to, um, yeah, to see an, another voice, another storytelling. And that was uh, very um, funny to, uh, to do. I hope it doesn't fall. <laughs> OK. So I don't show my stamp, so that's also what we've done. That's easy. I can show it very quickly. These have stamps. Very, very quickly, very quickly. It's very hard to see anyway, so. Oops. Okay, the big book, and then I have only a few small books. Um, 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 yeah, so this book is, um, so this birthday book with, with the water and the mountains, this is the next book I did for Mr. van Vlissingen with Mr. van Vlissingen. It's also that I basically say I work with somebody and not for somebody. Um, when he, uh, he said my company, so the privately owned company, exists in 1996, 100 years. And he asked an art historian, Johan Pijnappel and me, to, um, to develop an idea for the celebration. He didn't say anything. He only said, can you make something unusual? I give you five years time. It, that is, I think that's a vision, if you give five years time, to develop a project. And it's up to you uh, how it's, what it will be. And um, so Johan is this art historian, and I'm this uh, book designer. And we said, well, what can we do? We, we thought about um, um, making a film, because we were both very much interested in film. But then we thought, well, how can we do it? And we need a director. And then we asked Woody Allen, and oh my god, no. Oh, OK, not a film. Let's do a CD-ROM. Let's go to the company Voyager. I, I don't know if they still exist, but they made uh, uh, CD-ROMs with, with image and sound and whatever. Then we thought, yes, let's do it. We went to New York, and then uh, at least I realized that if we work for five years on a project, whatever electronic thing we do, it will be old-fashioned or outdated. But the book will never be outdated. So we decided uh, very quickly to, uh, to make a book. And this is Johan Pijnappel. He has hair there. After five years, I can tell you, he had no hair. This is me, uh, 60 kilos. When the project was finished, I uh, was 87 kilos. I gained a lot. There's a little bit less new now, but still, I, I'm a fat lady. But um, I wasn't. I wasn't fat at all when I started the book. <laughs> but it's only because I sat and did the research. Jan and I both did the research for the book, and we were already friends. And we said we can only do this book 
uh, and commit ourselves for five years also to this company if we have a sort of structure of study. And uh, I can read it to you. The everyday phase of SHV is rendered special by the SHV mentality. We had no clue what that was, but they told us there was an SHV mentality. And SHV is a trade company, so they don't make something, they, they trade. And they were a heating coal uh, company. This study, which is being carried out for the company's 100th anniversary in 1996, focuses on the most salient examples of this mentality over the past 200 years, because we already decided not to do 100 years, but to do 200 years. Killing project. A dream project which became a nightmare. The quality of the final product will be created by the mutual spirit of cooperation between us and the president of SHV, Mr. Paul Fentoner van Vlissingen. And we wrote down ridiculous words, but we didn't censor it. Quality, use of materials, expressiveness, not pretentious, not fashionable, experimental, international, forward-looking, no harboring of grudges, <laughs> funny, enjoyment, not pushy, empathy, empathy, pleasure, hard work, dedication, special content, the why, responsibility, not dogmatic, stamina, and that's what we needed, and optimism, Irma Baumajan, Pineapple, in September 1991. That's the only piece we uh, didn't write for the book, but we put in into the book. And uh, so, in this this book has no, it has two thousand one hundred thirty six pages. We wanted to do five thousand, but it was impossible to produce in time, so we had to limit ourselves. Uh, <laughs> And um, oh, we had material for endless. But uh, and I found very uh, how can I? I should tell it precisely. So we said we don't want to write an history. Jan is not an, uh, histor an historian for companies, and I'm also not specialized in doing that kind of research. So we said we find all the material for the book in the archives, and like we said, we take the most salient events. And we make sort of case studies for the company. And we also we did a research about uh, uh, this kind of books, is this um, how do, Jubilee books. And Jubilee books are always written by professor, doctor, whatever. And the books are never read. So there are always books for, to put on a bookshelf. And that's what we didn't want to do. We wanted to have a book which you can actually use. So we decided to make a handbook. So it should look like a dictionary or a, yeah, like a handbook. And um, so and we said, because we're not experts, but we know what is, what is interesting, or at least we pretend that we know what is interesting for uh, future managers. And uh, that's basically what the book is. We uh, collected an enormous amount of material. <coughs> Too dry throat. <coughs> Sorry. And um, it's very dry. <coughs> it's also the paper which makes me dry. Um, but anyway, um, we said we make... Um, a book um, also w which represents a bit of our uh, history because uh, the Art Meet Science project, that's uh, how, uh, how we got to know him, uh, we also made part of the history of, of SHV. I have to find it. That's a bit of a problem if you make books with no page numbers. You never find what you're looking for and, uh, and the other way around, of course. Let's see, it must be somewhere here. I think so, yeah. Um, so, Robert Rauschenberg, I forgot to mention his name. He was also there, the Dalai Lama, David Baum, etc. Lawrence Wiener was also there, very important. Uh, let's see where Lawrence Wiener is, because Andrew has a work, and you have on the building a, a work by Lawrence Wiener. Let's see where he is. See, you never find it, it's really problematic. Uh, maybe, he, no, 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 here. Yes, Lawrence Wiener. Um, he um, and so also our so the, the, the this whole art meet science project was uh, based on a very Buddhistic uh, uh, f fundament and and also for us the the, the Dalai Lama and this whole 
thing was important to you and me. So we put uh, somewhere in the book in 49, uh, the, the time when the Dalai Lama had to flee from Tibet, Tibet to, our, to India, we made, um, how do you say that, with laser cutting, there's a, a, a Buddha printed. So it has nothing, basically nothing to do with SHV, but with our own history. And uh, we thought that was interesting to have in the book. And of course, they sponsored this Art Me Science project. Um, so it's, it's, of course, a very subjective uh, look at the history of SHV. And also, uh, for us, it was very difficult to, to know what the company is, because it's a company, they didn't have an archive. We made the archive. Uh, because it, it's a company which is looking forward and not looking backward. So we had to find all these annual reports, at least annual reports give you information. But till, until 68, uh, annual reports didn't have to be public. So um, from the annual reports from 96 to 1968 um, were all, uh, there was only one copy and we had to find all these copies because these annual reports gave us all the information about the more the philosophical background of and, and, and the steps the company would take for the next year. Because it's interesting, those annual reports were all talking about philosophy and the history of a specific year. Very nice and very uh, a lot of information. And the moment the the annual annual reports had to become public uh, the annual reports had no information it was all sort of secret and hidden things and pff, not interesting at all and also we sta decided not to uh, publish the uh, annual reports from that time on further the whole idea of the book is to have questions in the in the book so it's these 2136 pages with uh, text which has no articulation it's all very flat, and um, but only the, the 67 questions in the in the book relate to a case study. So if you see a question, then you know that there's a sort of case study. And um, yeah, what else? Yeah, for me, I worked so long on the book that I hardly can imagine what should I tell about this book. Um, that's really bad, of course. Um, I uh, the paper is my own recipe. And the paper has the, the, the corporate philosophy of the, the, of the company. That's, for example, look for the unusual. Listen, learn and react. Keep uh, things simple. And it's all in a, in a watermark in the book. And um, basically, um, I wanted to have a Japanese paper from a very specific plant. Really beautiful paper. Very thin. And then we could have that... 5,000 uh, pages, and now we have only yeah half. Um, and, uh, and and basically that paper was I could order it, even though it was quite expensive. But um, so I sent a fax to to Japan to order the paper for so many books and this and that, and uh, they were very happy to get that order. And then they sent a the fax back with the thing uh, with the line. It's ready, the paper is ready in 14 years. <laughs> 14 years. <coughs> we didn't have any uh, uh, limit in, in spending money, no budget, no limit at all, only time. So time, that was killing us. So, of course, we needed uh, the paper uh, one and a half year before, because then we already started to print, because the book had to be ready in 1996. And um, so I had to find another uh, print. This is actually the head office. And Johan and I were working here somewhere. And uh, actually, it was a very bad office we had. It was the, a former toilet group. And we were, uh, the, the room was under an air conditioning space, and we had no view. It was really very bad. But uh, that was also sort of a bit the philosophy of the company. Uh, don't treat people too well, because then they uh, act differently. So give them a low-key place, and then maybe they, we upgrade them. And we were upgraded. Finally, we were sitting next to uh, the CEO of the company. Um, because it's a privately owned company, uh, DEF uh, sp 
plays a very important role because if if a CEO uh, if a yeah the director is uh, died then of course you need a successor so that's always what you see in this book uh, uh, this uh, in memoriam um, things um, what else what else yeah the book is backward it starts in 1996 and goes back to 1799. Uh, maybe you see the edges. It's a Dutch company, but the language is, uh, is English because it's an international company. Um, so here is our, is a, our tulip fields. If you do this, I don't know if you see, you don't see it. But here is a, a poem printed on the edges in Dutch, and it's a poet uh, with a text saying something going from horizon into horizon. Um, 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 what else? This is Paul. Very handsome. I have to show a picture of him. He's very nice. Uh, where is he? Yeah, we didn't want to put too much images of him in the book because it's uh, the, the history of the whole company and not only about him, of course. So we really had to reduce... Uh, Amount, although I really wanted to have many images of him. It must be somewhere. It's somewhere here. Well, anyway, th it's there. I can show it maybe. No, I don't believe it. Okay. Um, and the book starts because it's um, uh, this, this commercial company. It starts with the financial statements of the company. And because the financial statements uh, were not our, uh, was not a thing Johan and I wanted to concentrate on. So we put all the financial sta statements, uh, like the share capital, the dividend, net income, the income tax, whatever. Um, it's all printed in laser cutting. So it's cut it, it's not printed. <laughs> and also, uh, so that it's air, so it's it is important, but it's also not that important. And we also want to have a sort of future idea. So the book starts in 2096, and finally goes back to 80, 1896. That's always difficult. And uh, because they were uh, in the beginning only uh, a uh, company who sold uh, heating coal, we also have the temperatures of the last hundred years in the book. And uh, that was interesting because uh, this diagram, when you have cold winters, of course, the profits went up because they sold more heating coal. And when there's a warm winter, uh, they sold not so many. Also, when there was a strike in England, uh, they also sold more uh, heating coal because they imported coal from uh, Germany. Or if there was a strike in South Africa, ev you can read everything from the numbers from this diagram in this book that's their uh, basically that's their history and it's also very nice for me that the moment my Paul uh, became the CEO the profits whew, went really high he was a very good businessman and he he was a businessman without doing he had a sort of Tao uh, so Chinese thing in his office <coughs> saying uh, working without doing and that's basically what he did he always uh, said to somebody, maybe you can do this, maybe you can do that, and that really worked very well. So his desk was always uh, was always empty, and other people's desks were always full of work and getting the things done and etc. Okay, um, yeah, it's a heating coal company, and then we made uh, a white book. Yeah, so it gets dirty. That's the whole idea, that uh, the book gets dirty. And if it gets dirty, and if you use it, uh, a tax will appear. So, and that's a very funny thing. All the shareholders who got the book put plastic around it because they didn't want to get it, that it become dirty. And that was the whole issue, that it should become dirty. Because then a tax will uh, uh, appear or reveal after using it, and that's a text about the future of, uh, of SHV. Another thing is that you saw that the book is uh, beautifully open, when it's open, and that's only because the, the spine of the, of the book is, uh, with, um, is RVS, so stainless steel, and uh, that's why it's so beautiful. Uh, yeah, it's really a beautiful tension. And then you see all these uh, bookmarks, and all the bookmarks are, uh, if you put them in a specific order 
in the book, you will find the title of the book. But the title everybody knows now. It's uh, called Thinkbook. Because in Dutch, a gedenkboek is a... If you take out the G, it's a denkboek. And so in English, English, it's a Thinkbook. Because we wanted to make a book what is valuable for the next 500 years. Everything in the book is sustainable. So even the paper is uh, will last. That's what they told us. Nobody can check it. But for the uh, coming 500 uh, years... They printed so many copies for the uh, five for the next 500 years for the shareholders. Um, so that's that. It got a very specific place in the building because this is a this is a very heavy book. You cannot put it everywhere in the building because it's really a heavy weight, especially if you have 4,000 of those. Um, and there's also a Chinese version because Johan and I wanted to do a book in Spanish, English and Chinese but after the Chinese we quit because it was totally exhausting to make another book and we, th we thought we should stop um, anyway but that's, so that's also in Chinese and then I show my last books so if I make books I always make these models I have tons and tons of uh, models I've made and uh, and I make these models because then I can see better the, the rhythm of a book. It's much easier for me to do it. It's a lot of work I must say to, to make these small uh, books but it's also a lot of fun. So for Sheila Hicks I made maybe 20 or 30 and uh, I don't know what else I have here. But anyway so they're in a black and white or it doesn't matter. Oh this is for, for the Apple for the art gallery in Amsterdam. I made these books, but then I see how the, the, the images and the text is, uh, how do you say that, uh, um, how do you say it, verdeeld, distributed. Um, so it helps me a lot to, um, to, to make. Um, and then, it's the very last books. This, and sometimes I make the book with the real cover, like this is with this thermo uh, ink thing. So, but then I also make it uh, with the right material. And also uh, for the inside, this is a book for Belgian, for architects from Belgium. Also make it with the newsprint paper or whatever. It's really tiny, but it, it, it's always very helpful to me. But sometimes I think, well, I, I wish I could keep the book so small. It's really much nicer. But to make a small book is very difficult and very expensive. <coughs> so uh, I can tell you, I have a show in June in Amsterdam, and my catalog will be this. It will be small. Finally, because it's sponsored and subsidized, I can do it. Uh, but the best book I will show to you tonight is this Tiny, 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 tiny book. It's really extremely tiny. I haven't designed it. It's, uh, it's, I got it from friends from uh, Hungary. It contains the Internationale. But the Internationale in any language you can imagine. From, what is it here? Hebrew, uh, Chinese, uh, Japanese. In all languages extremely well bound, nice end papers and yeah, this is how I want to end the lecture with the most beautiful book I have in my collection. Thank you for listening so long.